the year is still young. We are just in uh, fifth and a half weeks. Uh, it's not up to six weeks of this new year, and I'm sure it's still time to adjust. Um, and, but it, it, it flies, so we have like 46 weeks to go and they will fly sooner or later. And what we have been trying to do is to lay some building blocks and some foundational principles and guidelines for all of us together to be able to have a successful, effective and fruitful year. Because we are a people of faith, uh, we defer to God. We believe that God has his plans and his purposes for us. Um, in the Bible, it clearly states in a book called Jeremiah. Jeremiah is the name of a prophet, one of the merry prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, many of them. In Jeremiah's book, in the 29th chapter <coughs> and the 11th verse, there is a verse that goes like this. It's quite popular. It says, God says, I know the plans that I have for their plans for good and not for evil. I think that describes who God is in his intrinsic capacity. God is not an evil God, a bad God, a capricious demon that wants to pay back and kill you and destroy you. God says, I know the plans that I have for you. They are plans for good and for evil to give you a hope, to give you an end with an expectation or an expectation at the end. And God, when he says that, it means that that's his intent. Obviously, God's intent requires or maybe demands man's response. Or maybe I should put it this way, God's initiatives always demand our response. I mean, if the response of man is not there, the cycle is it's not complete. There is another scripture that just comes to my mind in the Gospel of Mark, one of the four Gospels, the angel, where Jesus Christ was given a parable and he said some people are like this. Then he said they are like the people that said, we cried unto you and you did not cry back. Or we piped unto you and you did not pipe back. Or we played the harp and you did not dance. It's a call and response. It's an action and reaction. So God's initiatives, his intent for us as a nation, as individuals, um, is for good. It's not for evil. It's to give us a future, a hope, and an expected end. Obviously, without stretching it, the issue remains as to how we respond, when we respond, and whether we respond the right way. The king we have been studying since January, really, um, because we're looking at how to make responses that please God, because at the end of the day, it is God. Whatever we say is God. If it works out well, it's going to be him. If it doesn't work out well, God has the ultimate power for everything. But because he did not make us robots and, and um, instinctive animals, but rational beings with uh, cognitive powers, with intuition, with conscience, with emotions, with willpower, um, then we must be able to respond. And the, the, the best response is based upon knowing the heart and the intent of God and on a lateral level also having all the information and the facts at your disposal. So just to recap a little bit, you know the story because we've done it for a while now. This young Solomon, one of David's sons, came to the rightful throne came to the throne rightfully, even though one of his brothers, Adonijah, had hijacked the throne. But Adonijah wanted out and Solomon stayed on the throne. And we advised ourselves as we studied from the scriptures in 1 Kings, 1 Kings, not 2 Kings, 1 Kings in chapter 3, as we read the account, we saw that based on everything that preceded him coming to the throne, the, the family sibling rivalry, the, the division in the nation, and the, the camps and the cliques, that um, he could have done what most people would want to do. Because for some reason, whenever people come into leadership, authority, influence, or power, we tend to think that we always have enemies. So this person is my enemy, that one is my enemy, these people are against me, these ones are undermining me, so let's go out for them. And um, sometimes we waste our whole time dealing with enemies instead of looking at the progress of the people who are being blessed. And so God, we are told in this scripture in 1 Kings chapter 3, asked King Solomon and said to him, ask what you want. What is it that you want? As I said before, here is a king who's come to the throne. He's had opposition from his brothers. He doesn't know whether they're going to plan to take him out. He knows that the nation is divided. So what does he do? 
this is what he says. He says, God, first of all, I do not even know how to go in and come out as a king. I'm a young man. I was not prepared for this. I was not schooled for this. But it looks like fate has brought me to this or the choice of my father has brought me into this. Because once you're born in a royal family, chances are you inherit royally when it's a monarchy. Not when it's a democracy or a republic, but when it's a monarchy. And so... Um, he said, I'm a young man. I don't know what to do. And these people are great people. I'm standing now in the shoes of my father, David, who was a great king because it was God who chose David and told prophet Samuel that I have found a king for myself in a particular man's house. The man is called Jesse. The man had all these sons who are now um, going to be problems later on in life. And um, God chose him and God called David the man after my heart. I think that's about the only person that has ever been given the tool in the Bible. The man after my heart. And even though when God said it, David was a young guy taking care of his father's sheep but his heart was totally sold out to God and in everything he did as much as possible showed his desire for God and even when he made mistakes he was quickly quick to come back to God because his heart was righteous for God and so <clears throat> Solomon inherited his father great king great people young boy he can't even discuss the the realm with his brothers because his brothers are against him and god, god asked him what do you want and what took god was solomon's response the fact that he responded right he said to god god because i don't know what to do just give me an understanding heart give me a learning heart give me a wise heart give me some translations of the Bible says, give me a large heart or give me a loss of heart. Give me an accommodating heart that can take all kinds of people. Because as I explained last week, when you are dealing with a monolith or a monocultural um, organization or body, it's always easy. Everybody knows what to do. But when you are dealing with divergent constituencies, then there's so much that you have to do because what the children need is different from what the octogenarians need, it's different from what the people in the hospital need, it's different from what the prisoners need, it's different from what the military needs, it's different from the religious people need, what the young people need. Some people go to religious houses, some go to nightclubs, some don't go anywhere. You know, you have to be able to synergize them all for the common good as our national anthem says and that's at every level family level i mean if a family divides the parents like this child they don't like that child no they get to understand that well this child doesn't take much sugar in his milk this child doesn't eat fish um, this child is more sporty this one likes to read this child likes a lot of fashion this you know you 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 synergize them because at least in the family you brought them into the world and so it goes to the bigger family the united nations the world and so when Solomon asked God for wisdom. The response of God was that it's almost like God said, wow. It's almost like that. Look at this young guy. He could have asked for everything that everybody else asks for. And that's why there is always the normal and there is the, let me say the better. And this is how I want to defend this. There is a parable for learning in the scriptures, again in the New Testament, that Jesus Christ taught. He said, Anytime somebody compels you to go one mile, it's a compulsion. They are asking you against your will. Maybe they are forcing you. They are cajoling you. They are talking and begging you. Maybe if it's a woman, they are crying. If you love me, you will do it. When they push you to go one mile, this is what Jesus Christ says. When you go the one mile, go another extra. Because when you do that extra, you are not compelled. You are doing it from your own volition, from your free will. And I think the import is that the person who compelled you now looks at you and finds out that what they compelled you to do holds no water anymore. Because they thought you would go one, but you went two, or you went four, or you went six. So it's like, wow, where they thought they were pushing you down, you were showing them a greater side of your life and so that's how it is king solomon could have asked as god said he could have asked for the neck of his enemies he could have asked for riches and he could have asked for self-perpetuation for long life on the throne but he didn't ask for any of those things he asked for wisdom and a large heart and god said to him because you have not asked for yourself you have not been selfish you have not just looked to what you and you and you alone wants 
I'm going to give you what you asked for and also what you did not ask for, I will give you. And I'm going to give you wealth, 